Grab yourself a coffee and pull up a seat because today we move on to part two of how to play Tenaris Adventures. I'm Mark Maya and this is Board Game Coffee. Get back here this instant! Oh. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, I love you too, I couldn't have done it without you. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome to part two of how to play Tenaris Adventures. In the first video, we covered everything you needed to know to get you through the opening tutorial quests, which are not optional, by the way. But in this video, we'll be teaching you everything that happens in between quests, and that includes the city phase, world phase, team building, campaign log, and a bunch of other stuff. Now, if you haven't already watched the first video, I highly recommend you do that, because this video continues exactly where that video left off. In the last video, we ended with what happens after you complete the tutorial quest. But in this video, we're going to start with what happens after you complete a regular quest and take it from there. Multiple paths choices is just one of the different steps you'll take when completing a non-tutorial quest. But there's a whole lot more you'll need to learn if you want to take your campaign to the next level. From this point on, when I'm talking about quests, I'm referring to the non-tutorial type. And we're going to learn all about it starting now. Loot is a common reward that you'll earn for completing a quest. And it doesn't belong to any one player. It's shared amongst the entire group. Loot is used to buy items and upgrade structures during the city phase which we'll cover later. For now, our main concern is how much loot do we get? Once you complete a quest, gain three random loot cards from the loot deck. Make sure the deck is shuffled before you do. If you completed the extra challenge for the quest, along with completing the primary objective, draw two additional loot cards. Then draw one loot card for every first aid kit you didn't use, and one loot card for each of your Kemet Hunt levels. But since ours is currently set to zero, it earns us nothing. We'll talk more about Kemet Hunt levels later. So, as you can see, there's a lot of loot gaining potential if you complete a quest. But what if you lose? If you lose a quest, you still draw loot cards, just less of them. When a quest is lost, draw two random loot cards. Do not draw cards for completing the extra challenge or for any remaining first aid tokens. But you do draw cards based on your Kemet Hunt level, which in our case is still nothing. This is the calendar. The calendar is broken up into weeks. Each week consists of four quests, three city phases, and one end of world phase which takes place at the end of the week. From the first time you're given the option to choose from multiple adventure paths, you'll be recording the letter of the adventure card you chose on the calendar. So if you choose quest E, D would go back in the box and you would write the letter E in this space here before you start the next quest. Below that, you'll write the Kemet Hunt level, which determines how difficult the quest is going to be. For our first quest, I'm just gonna fill it in with a zero. As you can see by the calendar, after each quest, you'll either have a city phase or a world phase. So once we've played through quest E, we would move on to our first city phase, which we'll learn about in just a minute. Each time you finish a city phase, come back to the calendar and mark it as completed. Same goes for the world phase, except those only happen at the end of the week. Then you'll fill in the next box with the letter of the next quest you're taking and enter the Kemet Hunt level for that quest. All right, let's learn about the city phase. First thing you'll need to do when entering the city phase is set up the city. Unfold the map and lay it out in the center of the table city side up. Collect all 24 NPC cards with this initial text in the upper right corner. Shuffle them together with your four hero cards and place them on this character deck space. As you progress through the campaign, you'll unlock more heroes and NPCs. 
When you do, include them in the character deck when you shuffle it. Next, check the calendar to confirm the current week. According to this, we're still in week one. Gather all NPCs with the current week indicated here. Shuffle them together and randomly place one up in each of these spaces. The remaining NPCs can stay face down to the side of the map. It's important to note that only NPCs from the current week will appear in the city. So, once you enter week 2, week 1 NPCs will never be placed on the city map again. Place all your level 1 structures in the matching locations. Then, collect all the cards of the heroes you're not using, excluding special heroes and this one hero named Magenta, and place it nearby. It's possible you won't need this deck, but I like to be prepared. Also, gather all the loot cards, shuffle them up, and place them face down somewhere near the map. And lastly, draw four cards from the top of the character deck to create one hand of cards. Repeat this process three more times until you have four separate hand of cards. Regardless of your player count, you'll always have four hands of cards. Each player should take one hand, and the remaining non-player hands will be played by the group. Hands of cards, even non-player hands, must be kept separate from each other and can never be combined. Now you're ready to play the City Phase. The City Phase is where players recruit new NPCs, earn loot from expeditions, upgrade structures, and buy new items. During the City Phase, each player and non-player, if you're playing with less than four people, gets one turn to do as much as they can with the cards in their hand. When it comes to playing the non-player hands of cards, the group will decide how they're used. But what are they used for? The city map is broken up into three challenges, expeditions, NPCs, and structures. The hero and NPC cards in your hand are used to cover the cost of those challenges and unlock their benefits. To do that, you'll play cards from your hand until you've satisfied the requirements of a particular challenge. For example, this challenge here requires three points of force and two points of spycraft. So to cover this cost, I'll play these two cards. Together, their total ability values meet and even exceed the requirements needed to complete this challenge. Any excess ability points are lost. They can't be used to cover the cost of another challenge. All of the cards used to cover the cost of a challenge are placed in the character's discard pile before another challenge can be attempted. On their turn, a player can continue to spend cards to complete challenges as long as they can cover the entire cost of that challenge. You can't pay half now and then the other half on another player's turn. It's all or nothing. Any cards you don't use on your turn will stay in your hand, and depending on what cards you keep, you might be able to pitch in on someone else's turn. When you see an NPC with this lightning bolt symbol next to its ability, it means that you can use that portion of its card on another player's turn. For example, if Brittany was trying to complete this challenge, but she didn't have enough intelligence to cover the cost, I could play my NPC's Lightning Bolt ability to help her out. So it might be a good strategy to hold on to these Lightning Bolt abilities rather than spending them on your turn. Or not, it really depends on your situation. Players are free to discuss and even play with their cards face up in order to plan ahead and get the most out of each turn. Because in the end, everything you get benefits the entire team. Some NPCs have other abilities that don't necessarily help you complete challenges, but can come in really handy during the city phase. Oh, and this window here, you can ignore that for now. It only comes into effect when starting a quest. All right, now that you know how to cover the cost of a challenge, what do they do? Let's go over a few examples. Expedition challenges are a good way to earn some extra loot. When you go on an expedition, 
pay the challenge costs listed and place the appropriate number of cubes in the holding area. Pay this much, place one cube. Pay this much, place two cubes. The color of the cubes you place doesn't matter, so just use whatever you have on hand. This rule applies to all the other challenges as well. All cubes placed on an expedition will remain there until the end of the city phase. The Conquer NPC challenge is where you'll recruit new NPCs for your team. Any recruited NPCs will be added to your character deck to be used in future city phases, and will also provide you with a few bonuses during the campaign, but we'll cover that a little later. When you cover the cost listed on an NPC, place a cube of any color on it as a reminder that it's been recruited. It's yours now, so no need to recruit it again. But don't take the card just yet. Leave both the card and the cube where they are until the end of the city phase. Completing structure challenges is how you'll buy and upgrade your items, as well as increase the level of cards you can use for your heroes. And the more cubes you add, the more you can do. To add a cube to a structure, you have a couple of options. In this example, you can either pay 3 Spycraft or 3 Diplomacy to add a cube of any color. And you can do this repeatedly or add to another structure. It's completely up to you. And if you can pay for more than one cube at a time, then you get all the cubes you paid for. Nothing's lost. The maximum amount of cubes any one structure can hold will be indicated on the structure card itself. And as always, the cubes you place will stay there until the end of the city phase. Alright, once the last player or non-player hand of cards has been played out, your board might look something like this, with colored cubes placed on all the different challenges that you've completed. Now, for the purposes of teaching, I'll be moving and adding cubes around the map as I speak, but during your game, once a cube is placed, it cannot be moved. Alright, let's start at the top and work our way down, which is important because any loot we gain from these expeditions can be used in the structure section at the bottom. For every cube you have in the expedition area, collect one random loot card. Then, for every three cubes you have, collect an additional loot card. Now you can remove your cubes from the expedition section. Next, any NPC with a cube on it will be added to your character deck. It's now yours forever. And if you've managed to recruit three NPCs, you'll also get a random loot card. And that brings us to structures. Alright, buckle up, because there's a lot we can do here. The cubes that were placed above the structure are used to pay for the bonuses listed below it. For example, if I pay two cubes plus one gold and one gem, I can draw two random hero cards from the hero deck we set aside at the start of the city phase. Then I could add one of those heroes to my character deck and shuffle the rest back into the hero deck. Characters you earn this way will now be available to use throughout your campaign. Down here, I can pay two cubes to get one gem from the loot deck. At the bottom, it says if we pay one cube, three gems, and two iron, we can upgrade our structure to the next level, which improves what we can do with this structure. Okay, this next part requires a few steps, so I saved it for last. By paying one cube, I can draw two random light armor cards at the level indicated on the structure. For this example, let's pretend that our structure is at level 4. Based on what I see here, the light armor items I'm pulling should be at level 2. To do this, find all the item cards of the type and level indicated and shuffle them together. Then draw two cards randomly from that stack and place them face up on the table where everyone can see. At this point, you can buy either of these light armor cards by paying the cost listed here. In addition to paying the material cost, you also have to discard a card of the same type. In this case, light armor. The card you discard must either be one level below the item you want to buy 
or the same level. So if I wanted to buy this level two Inferno tunic, I would pay two gems, two gold, and discard a level one light armor card. Any items that are discarded or that the group doesn't buy will go back in the box, and all the materials spent will be shoveled back into the loot deck. During the process of buying an item, if you don't have an item of the same type that is exactly one level below it or of the same level, you can't buy the item, even if you have all the resources required. If you get yourself in a situation where your structure is telling you to draw level two items, but no one on the team has a level one item of that type, not to worry. You always have the option of drawing the two cards randomly from a lower level. But if you choose to do this, then both cards must come from the same level. The only part about structures that we haven't covered yet is this attack card area here. As we've seen before, these insignias refer to specific character roles, in this case, tactician and controller. The numbers beside these insignias represent the level of primary attack cards that those characters have access to, the cards with the silver border. Now, just so we're clear, for the rest of this example, we're only discussing the primary attack cards, not the special attack cards. Throughout the campaign, the primary attack cards are the one you'll be switching in and out as you upgrade your structures. The special attack cards for each character will remain the same for the entire campaign. And although it's not listed on every card, all the primary attack cards you start the campaign with are considered level zero attack cards. All right, with that said, let's continue. Being that this is a level one tavern, both of the indicated character roles would only have access to level zero primary attack cards, which is what we started the campaign with, as we can see here with these controller cards. Now, if we upgrade the tavern by one level, we can see here that those character roles now have access to two level one attack cards. So when assembling their attack cards for the next quest, either of those character roles can equip two of their level zero cards which are the cards you started with, and two level one cards. Which cards from those levels that you use is up to you, and it can change from quest to quest. Although it has to maintain this format. You can't use three level one cards and a level zero. The only exception to breaking this format is if you want to use weaker cards. For example, you can swap this level one card out for a level zero card. But regardless of the cards you choose, you can only ever take four primary attack cards into battle with you. Let's skip ahead to the future a bit. If you upgrade your tavern to level six, your tactician and controller can now take into battle a level three primary attack card, a level two primary attack card, and two level one primary attack cards. Not too shabby. The other structures you'll find in the city will do the same thing for other character roles. So if your tanker bruiser wants better attack cards, you'll need to upgrade the Iron Hand Outpost. And that's it for the city phase. At this point, you can fold up your map and prepare for the next quest. First thing you're going to do before starting a new quest is assemble your team. You're not locked into using the same heroes or card setup you had before, although how much you can change at the start will be limited due to the fact that you probably haven't unlocked that many new things yet. When building your team, you can use anything that you've unlocked throughout your campaign. Items, heroes, attack cards, etc. And as long as you follow the rules that we discussed in the first video regarding which characters you can have on your team, what items and attack cards those characters can use, you should be good. You can also select new skills on your skill pad. At first, you'll only have access to level one skill tokens that restrict you to these level one skills here at the bottom. But at some point during your adventure, as you follow along with the game's story and instructions, 
you'll reach a point where all players will be instructed to use a specific set of skill tokens. In which case, you can assign those new tokens to any row that is equal to or less than the value shown on the token. After you've completed your first city phase, you'll be able to include NPCs into your team. Each hero, including comrades, can have one NPC assigned to them. NPCs aren't playable characters. Their only purpose is to augment the hero that they're assigned to, and they do this in one of two ways. Firstly, before the quest starts, you'll apply the quest power of your NPC as it's written in this quest power window. Aside from that, their only other purpose is to buff up your hero's ability points. Whenever a hero is asked to make an ability test, like rolling to see if they can pass an intelligence test, for example, they'll combine their intelligence value with the intelligence value of their NPC before they make their roll. Let's run through a quick example of an ability test. And in order to avoid spoilers, I will be making all of this up. The situation, I mean, not the rules. Okay, so you've come across a part in the story that asks each hero to test their diplomacy. If the hero passes the test, something good happens. And if they fail, something bad happens. But whatever the result, the journal will guide you through each step. First thing you do when taking a test is roll a d20 and add the result of the die to your hero's diplomacy value. If the total adds up to 10 or more, they pass the test. If it's less than 10, they fail. But if they had an NPC with them, they would include that NPC's diplomacy value to the result, which could make all the difference. In many cases, these tests will have an impact on the quest you are about to play. If the result of a test instructs a hero to place a cube in a numbered slot, it's referring to the numbers on the hit point track. What it does once it's there, the journal will fill in. Okay, so we learned earlier that after each quest, we enter a city phase, unless it's the last quest of the week, in which case we enter the world phase. During the world phase, you'll complete challenges across this map in order to unlock bonuses and perks that you'll track in your campaign log. As you eventually conquer these individual regions, you'll gain access to new areas of the map as well as more bonuses and perks. The world phase plays very similar to the city phase, although the reward system is very different. To set up the world phase, first place the world map in the center of the table. Then shuffle your character cards together to form your character deck. Your character deck is made up of your initial NPC cards, any additional NPCs you recruited during the city phase, and any hero cards you've unlocked along the way including the heroes you started the game with. Then shuffle them all together and place them in the character deck holding area. Next, draw out four hands of cards containing four cards each. And just like the city phase, you always draw four hands of cards, even if you're playing with less than four players. But each hand must still be played separately as if it belonged to an individual player. When you start the world phase for the first time, imagine that your team has conquered this refugee region, and that's where they'll start. Each player will then take a turn playing cards from their hand to cover the challenge cost listed on any space adjacent to the regions that the players have conquered. So at the start, you'll only have access to these regions, because this is the only region that the team has conquered. Each time you cover the cost of a challenge in a region, place a cube of any color in that space and discard the cards that were used. You can place cubes in this way as many times as you can meet the requirements of a challenge, and you're not limited to one region. But whatever you do, do as much of it as you can. A little note about NPCs in the world phase before we continue. Unlike the city phase, when you play an NPC in the world phase, you can only use the abilities in this little window. The rest of the card can be ignored. Unless you're playing with the ultimate edition, 
in which case the city phase abilities can be used during the world phase. Once you've played all four hands of cards, your world map might look something like this. At the end of the world phase, you'll earn bonuses and perks based on how many cubes you placed in a particular region. For example, let's say, as a team, we completed the challenge in this region three times during the world phase. The colors indicated here represent specific warpoint categories and what each color stands for is identified on this legend. So, since we have three cubes in this region, we'll earn war points towards these first three categories. One point in Diplomacy, one Wild Point we can use in any category, and one point in Spies. The war points you earn during the World Phase are tracked here on your campaign log. Each point is assigned to the first available box in the section it represents, with the wild point assigned to whichever category you want. As the campaign progresses, you'll continue adding more points to this log. When you've earned enough points in a single category to reach one of these symbols, refer to the legend within that category to see what you've earned. It's all pretty self-explanatory, but there are two symbols I'd like to bring your attention to, this starburst symbol and envelope. When you reach one of these envelope symbols, you get to open the envelope that matches the warpoint category you unlocked it in and the tier you are currently on. But until this happens, do not open these envelopes. When you reach one of these starbursts, you'll earn yourself a perk in the related category equal to the level tier you've achieved. Perks are passive bonuses that are always active and always benefit your team. Once you unlock a perk, it's yours for good. The perks you earned are tracked in your campaign logs, and it works like this. If the starburst we reached was inside this spies window, then that's the area that we'll get our perk in. The perk we earn is equal to the tier we are currently on in that category. So, since we're here on Tier 1, we get to check off a single Tier 1 perk. As you progress through the tiers, you'll earn more powerful perks. All the cubes you placed on the map are recorded here on this region map. Just simply check off these boxes based on the number of cubes you placed in that region. The next time you come back to the world phase and place cubes in those regions, you'll continue from where you left off. So in this example, we can see that we've already earned the war points for these first three categories. So any cubes we add now will go toward the categories that follow. In this case, white, yellow, and white. Once you fill all six boxes of a particular region, it's considered conquered by your team, and you'll indicate that by filling in this box here. You can't add cubes to a region that has been conquered, and six is the maximum amount of war points you can earn from a single region. By conquering regions, you increase your reach because as mentioned earlier, you can only add cubes to regions that are adjacent to those that players have conquered. At various points of your journey, you'll come across a puzzle challenge. The rules for any particular puzzle are pretty straightforward and will be explained on the same page as the puzzle itself. There are a lot of puzzles in Tenaris, but one of the most common puzzles you'll come across is the lock puzzle. So let me run you through an easy one that I'm sure you'd have gotten anyways. When you come across a lock puzzle, you'll be instructed where to find it. The goal of all lock puzzles is to get the ball from its starting point to the goal by moving it along this path. But if at any point during its journey the ball comes within one space of these magnets, the ball is destroyed. In addition, if there are any magnets remaining on the board when the ball reaches the goal, you fail. So what we have to do is eliminate the magnets. Now, for the purposes of this example, I'll be animating the ball and pins, but 
You'll just have to use your imagination when playing it yourself. As explained in the instructions for this puzzle, players must place these two different pins in the available slots to eliminate the magnets without destroying the ball in the process. For this puzzle, we have access to a trap pin and a watchtower pin. Pins are inserted into these open spaces, and each space can only hold one pin. As soon as a pin is inserted, its effect takes place immediately. When placing the pins, it's important to note that the red trap pin must be placed first, and its effect must be applied before placing the green watchtower pin. The red pin, called the trap, will eliminate any magnet or ball within one space of it. So if we placed it here, it would eliminate this magnet, but it would also eliminate the ball as soon as it starts moving. If we placed it here, it would eliminate this magnet, but then eliminate the ball as soon as it gets within one space of it. So the safest space to place this trap pin would be here, which will instantly eliminate this magnet without affecting the ball. Now the green pin is fairly powerful. It destroys all magnets in the same row and column that it's been placed on. The catch is those magnets must be at least two spaces away from the green watchtower pin. Any magnet adjacent to it will not be destroyed. Another benefit is that the green watchtower pin will not destroy the ball, although the ball and other pins will block its line of sight. And what it can't see, it can't destroy. So since this magnet has already been dealt with, all we have to do is deal with this magnet here. If we place the green pin here, it would not destroy the magnet because the magnet is within one space of the pin. But by placing it here, we are far enough away from the magnet to destroy it. Once all the pins are in place, run the ball along the path toward the goal. If all the magnets are destroyed, the ball will travel safely to its goal and you would have succeeded. Once you've completed the puzzle, you can go to the indicated page to see if you got the answer right. If you got it right, follow the instructions. If you got it wrong, follow those instructions. Okay, I did say we would get to it later, and later is now. Kemet Hunt is a difficulty level that you set yourself to make the game easier or harder. The first time you play Teneris, the Kemet Hunt level will be set to zero. Although you do have some control over the difficulty level, you're only able to increase it if your team meets a specific criteria. If you successfully complete a quest and its extra challenge without using a single first aid token or opening any chests, you can increase your Kemet Hunt level by one for the next quest you play. And Keep in mind, this is totally optional. You can play the entire game with the level set to zero if you want. It's all about setting it to your comfort level. But if you do raise the Kevin Hunt, record the level increase on the calendar underneath the next quest section. If you missed on even one of the criteria points I mentioned, you cannot increase your Kevin Hunt level. These limitations are put in place as safeguards to make sure that you don't get in over your head too fast. Once you increase your commit hunt level, it stays increased until one of two things happen. If you fail a quest with a commit hunt level higher than zero, then you must reduce your level by one. The other way your difficulty level drops is by simply deciding to drop it. At any time before you start a quest, you can decide to drop the difficulty level by any amount to make it easier. But whether you failed the quest or chose to lower the difficulty level on your own, you cannot raise it again until you've met the criteria again. As mentioned earlier in the video, a higher Kemet level will earn you extra loot when you complete a quest successfully. But those are the benefits. As you increase your Kemet Hunt level, 
you're essentially making the game harder for yourself, which is great for people who are looking for more of a challenge or just want more loot. If your Kemet Hunt level is at 1, each hero starts the quest with one of their special attacks already spent, the choice of which is yours. Or they can decide to keep their special attack and take 13 damage instead. If your Kemet Hunt level is at 2, 3, or 4, then the quest guide will instruct you to place additional villains based on your level. In some cases, these new tougher villains will replace weaker ones. So when you see a villain on your map layout indicated with these stars, it represents your current Kemet Hunt level. So if your Kemet level is at 2, you would place this 2 star villain, but not this one because it has 3 stars. But if your Kemet level was at 3, then you would place both the 2 star villain and the 3 star villain. Once your Kemet Hunt level reaches 5, you no longer place chests on the board. So just ignore the ones displayed on your map layout. And if your Kemet level is set to 6, which is the maximum amount it can be set to, players must distribute 75 points worth of damage amongst all the heroes. How the damage is distributed is completely up to you. It doesn't have to be even, it just has to total 75. Now, keep in mind, all these effects are cumulative. So if you're at level 6, you get all the bad things. And that's it. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Hey there. Pardon my interruption. Mark from the future here. I've been asked by the team over at Dragori Games to include a few additional game playing tips and overall concepts that you should keep in mind while playing Tenaris Adventures. So here we go. Use equals flip. Whenever you use an attack, item, or skill, remember to flip it over. When skill tokens are flipped, they can still be used, they just cost more. Abilities written on your attack and item cards, on the other hand, cannot be used until the card is flipped face up again. So let's go over how each of those things flip back over. If your primary attacks are all face down when your turn starts, flip them face up. Special attacks, on the other hand, cannot be flipped face up until the current quest is completed. As soon as all your skill tokens have been flipped, flip them back over again. When flipping all your primary attacks face up again, you also get to flip one item card face up as a reward. Prepare for villain actions. When starting a round, ask yourself two questions. Who does the villain want to attack? and who do I want them not to attack? Remember, villains have favorite targets, so it's easy to see who they will attack next. Use that information to your advantage and send them in the direction of your choosing. And if you can use that information to trigger the passive effect of your heroes, all the better. Don't focus only on one enemy. The most obvious strategy in a game like this is often to kill off an enemy completely to remove that source of damage from the board. But if you try to do that here, you might be in trouble. Remember, enemies will retaliate after being attacked, but all the enemies that you have not attacked when the round ends will take their turn and apply a plus five unprovoked damage bonus to their attack. So you might want to consider spreading out the damage you deal among all the enemies, which in many cases, might be the better option. No such thing as bad luck. Use your skills wisely to mitigate bad luck. Let's say you attacked an enemy and your attack missed. But even if it was enough to kill your enemy, residual damage cannot reduce the enemy's health points to lower than one. However, if an ally has enough mana and a skill that deals damage, they can finish that enemy off for you during your turn, because skills can only be used during an ally or villain's turn. So keep an eye on your mana so you can help mitigate those bad rolls when it's important. All right, now that you're all tipped up, let's go back to the video for our side on. And that's it. I hope this video helps and I hope you enjoy playing Tenaris Adventures. See you next week.
Thanks for joining us. If you like this video and you want to see more, subscribe to our channel. It's the best way to keep up to date with everything we do here at Board Game Coffee. But if you want to see more right now, we got plenty of videos to choose from. And if that's not enough, follow us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. I'm Mark Maya, and this is Board Game Coffee. And remember, have fun, keep gaming, be social. See you next week.